Even heroin is not very popular anymore. It's all about meth. We are the most ravenous consumers of narcotics in the world. We still are. Did you or your parents cut people's heads off? A human skull on a stick is an excellent way to communicate. The CIA became interested in them. Shocker. You know, what the WA really want is to be ruled by white men. They didn't want that at all. When the DEA says, oh, that's just a criminal syndicate. They're just this like jungle mafia. Why would China support a heavily armed narco state? Yeah, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, right? What's the alternative? To have power vacuums and a bunch of smaller piranhas just chewing each other to bits, massive amounts of bloodshed on the Chinese border. They don't want that. Drugs got to go somewhere. I said they're highly organized. They're not quite organized enough to have a dictator. It felt like a lucky break, but when you're obsessed with something for 10 years and you keep beating your head against the wall, I guess eventually the door opens. So I read the book, man, and I was thinking, all right, this guy is going to some crazy place in the mountains. What's this all about? And then I realized not only are you going to Burma or Myanmar, you're going to this substate of Burma, which is essentially a narco state run by a big drug cartel. So even if you get there and something goes wrong, then you escape, you're then you're you're in Burma. So it's it's with a military junta that maybe doesn't want you there. So I, I don't know. It just seems like a really daring thing to do. And I thought, okay, either this guy's got a screw loose, he's missing something, uh, or, or he's fearless, or it's just not that dangerous and it's just all kind of a big misunderstanding. But then, of course, after I read the book, I was like, no, there's no misunderstanding here. These people are potentially very dangerous. Well, I'm not a fearless person. I have plenty to worry about. Um, I do try to get next to fearless people and get them to tell me their stories. I think very, very carefully before I take risks, is it worth it? And more importantly, am I going to bring trouble to someone else down the line? What propels me forward is usually an obsession with telling the story. And once I get fixated on a story, and this is one hell of a story, uh, that sort of helps me propel myself through any fear that I might have, but not a tough guy, as you as you can probably tell, just a really, really curious guy. Yeah, well, I'll take it. I'm, you never know who's tough, man. That's the thing. Some people look tough. They're not that tough. Other people don't look that tough. You don't want to mess with those people either. So by the way, is it Burma or Myanmar? In fact, in your book, you said, I flew to Burma, and but the guide asked you something and you hesitated before saying Myanmar or Burma in a conversation with the guide because it was politically charged either way, kind of. So what? first of all, which is it? Is it Burma, is it Myanmar, and why is it politically charged either way? What does that mean? Yeah, it's both. Burma is the colonial name for the country. It used to be a British colony. Uh, it was... Uh, after a mil military regime changed the name to Myanmar in 1989, a lot of people thought, well, we don't like this military regime. In fact, we despise this military regime. We're not going to switch over to calling it whatever you want to call it. The rationale from the regime was, let's get rid of the old colonial words and, and start, start fresh. But People that hate that regime, which includes the United States, includes the State Department, said, no, 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 we're going to continue to call it Burma. So why is it politically charged? If someone is from more the milieu of freedom fighters despising the regime, which is a large part of the population, they might prefer Burma. Uh, Myanmar, however, is the official name of the country. And I go back and forth all the time. Uh, it's, it's just it's not set in stone. Huh, interesting. Because, of course, we've heard of countries switching, like, oh, we're not Rhodesia anymore, right? But that's a, that's a different, it, it's really, it really is a different country in many ways at that point. And then you have other countries that go through revolutions like South Africa, and or, or big changes, I should say, like South Africa, they keep the name. And you have this place. So it's, it, yeah, it's confusing. But I can see, I, do people get offended if you use the wrong name? Or is it just like, oh, now I know your politics and maybe I like you a little bit less? Yeah, more the latter. I've never said Myanmar to someone and they gave me the stink eye. I will hear people who, look, I've talked to people who are actively trying to destroy the military regime. There's a raging uh, revolution happening there right now. And they'll use Myanmar because they grew up under the regime. 
They went to regime schools and that was what was beaten into their head. So you're not gonna, it's not a massive faux pas. It's a preference. Tell me about Wa State, because well, I've looked at many lists of countries and never heard of Wa State. So this is not an official country. And yet they seem to have their own government inside of Burma. And it, I don't understand how that's possible, really. Wa State is, for my money, the most fascinating place in the world. You're right. If you go to the UN, you're not going to see their flag on the wall. It's not formally recognized, but it is a fully functioning nation state inside Myanmar. So the military regime of Myanmar can't just go in. Wa State has borders. You go in and you're not invited, there's going to be big trouble. Once you get inside, you're going to see it's a country. It's a nation state. It has its own highways. It has its own electricity grid. It has its own cell phone towers. It's a government with uh, ministries of health, uh, finance. Uh, it, it runs its own school system. It's got everything that a country has. Now, do the leaders feel the need to go to the UN, to go to the world and say, please recognize us? No, they don't really care that much what the outside world thinks about them. They, they don't actually want to play that game. They're happy to have their own autonomous state and they know it exists and they don't really care if you think it exists too. So if I'm online playing Call of Duty, could I be playing with a kid from Wa State or is it not quite as developed as, and yes, I said kid because I don't know how many adults are on there. <laughs> and I'm not talking to people, just to be very clear. I'm not one of those creepy old guys on there. I'm playing. I don't care. I'm not ch ch chatting. <laughs> but I know that people play online games and sometimes like kids pop into those things. And, or is this just like a very isolated North Korea type place? You might find the sons or perhaps daughters of people who are highly connected in the WA government, which is run by sort of a ruling council. It's literally called a, a Politburo. Um, yes, they might have access to this. By and large, most WA people are living in villages that are pretty remote. They're farming. Uh, they previously made their money from farming the opium poppy. So in WA state, the soil is really bad. Picture, picture a topography that's like the Rockies, right? Like uh, peak slopes, peak slopes. It's not, it's not a wide open place where you could plant a lot of rice. It's tough to grow crops there. But on that, in that soil, it's very bitter and alkaline. It's actually perfect for growing the opium poppy. Opium poppies like chilly weather. They like bitter soil. And they produced massive amounts of this. This is what really, like geography steered the Wa people towards the drug trade. It wasn't necessarily a conscious choice. So yeah, back in the day, um, they, they've since switched to methamphetamine, which we can get into. But back in the day until, say, around the 90s, they were producing a lot of the opium that was synthesized into heroin that was nicknamed China White. It's actually from, from Wa State. That was making its way into the US. So I, for my generation, I was born in 1981. I was in middle school during like the grunge era and people were talking about heroin chic and the models were kind of wafy and people were ODing right. on heroin. So a lot of that stuff would have been coming from the WA territory. And that's, that is what brought the, that's what really caught the attention of, of the DEA. So I know that's a lot, but that's, it that's, is. Yeah. Do you know what percentage of American heroin came from WA state or any, any guess? I don't have to guess too much. It's somewhere like 50, 60% at its peak was coming, oh, wow. was coming from Myanmar. There was a rival heroin producer there, but the WA had the most um, plentiful and potent opium poppy. I mean, just like, uh, uh, maybe it's a crap analogy, but the way that grapes grow in wine country in France. So poppies just grow beautifully in, <laughs> in, in WA state. And the great thing about the opium poppy is... When you, when you collect all the opium, just this big clump of brown molasses opium, and you wrap it up in canvas or even put it in a clay pot, it does dry out and become more potent and refine itself, sort of like wine in a cask. So you can transport it really, really far if you need to. It's very handy if you're in a really isolated, landlocked, mountainous area, because you know it's not like you're going to grow... Uh, 
you know, tomatoes and onions and That's ship bananas, it to, yeah. yeah, and ship it to people in the cities, though it would be rotten by the time it got there. So that, again, that really pushed them towards, towards the drug trade. Right. We need a crop that grows in this garbage soil and doesn't rot slash gets better over time. And a small amount yields a high amount of money. And it doesn't matter how legal it is because we make the laws like you're just asking for drug trade under those circumstances. Yeah. And I would just add that um, in I know like 99.9 percent of Americans have never heard of the law, even though our no. our government has had a profound effect on on their civilization. That's about a, a million of them total. They live in the mountains where Burma and China meet and in, in Wa State. I know most people have not uh, have not heard of them, but like in Southeast Asia, they're one of the most denigrated and vilified people you can think of. So oh, really? if you, if, so if you say I'm, I'm wa to someone in a city like Bangkok, where I'm at right now, um, you mm -hmm. might hear a response. Oh, what are you, are you a drug runner? Uh, and the other thing you might hear is, oh, did, did you or your parents cut people's heads off? And that's the other big reputational thing about the wa until about the sixties, they did live in these isolated fortress like villages that were home to Wa warriors. And they did cut off their enemies heads and put them on sticks. And as I say in the book, it's easy to, to start denigrating from there, right? But as I say mm -hmm. in the book, French revolutionaries also severed heads and samurai did and Scottish clans did and they all had a reason. I mean, it wasn't just they were, they've been called savages. No, 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 no. It's more complicated than that. A human skull on a stick is an excellent way to communicate. No trespassing, stay out of my territory. And yeah. this, this shock value helped keep them free. So yeah, so that's the rep, uh, drug running and head hunting. Although they haven't, uh, there haven't been head severed in Wa state from what I could tell since the sixties, maybe the early seventies. Why did they stop doing that suddenly? It just seems like a weird departure. If you said they stopped a couple hundred years ago, I'd be like, well, okay, they joined civilization. The 60s, it's a little late to stop cutting off heads and putting them on sticks instead of writing a sign that says no trespassing. It's a little bit late in the game. Yeah, modernity had not come to them. So in the 60s, <laughs> right. they were still living as their great, great grandparents did. Uh, they got organized. So the problem was they weren't just cutting off intruders' heads, they were cutting off rival clans' heads. So a lot of, they were cutting each other's heads off. Some important figures rose up within Wa society and said, we've got to get united because the Wa territory is right next to China. And China went fully communist in 1949. There was a very legitimate threat of communists coming in and taking over their territory. So uh, they had to get united to repel that. It was very difficult to do. Also, the CIA became interested in them. Shocker, you have a, a indigenous people with a warrior reputation right on the back step of communist China, the largest communist country on earth. The CIA came in. I, I found this, this is insane. I found this uh, then secret memo from 1953 that the CIA wrote that said, you know, what the WA really want is to be ruled by white men. Oh, yeah, that always works out. <laughs> I'm sure they do. Can't wait. They didn't, as you as you as you might imagine. They didn't want right. that narrator. At all. They did not. They did not. Record scratch. Nope. But they did become of great interest to the CIA and the CIA did use their territory as a launching pad for raids into communist China. So they set up uh, these, what they call listening stations, listening posts in Wa territory that could soak up like, Chinese radio chatter from, from, the, from the People's Liberation Army. They could listen to what the Chinese were saying to each other. Then they, would, they recruited some pretty badass Wa warlords to go in there, steal documents, uh, tap phone lines and things like that. They did this with the help of uh, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan's military intelligence, which was a junior partner of the CIA and also highly opposed to communist China. That's really how the U.S. empire became interested in the WA. And just to put a pin on that, like today, WA state, 
as the the nation state slash narco state that it is, is very much uh, a target of the CIA and a target of the DEA. But back then, they thought they could use these opium harvesting indigenous warriors for American purposes. Yeah, that, that, that is quite fascinating. I, I would imagine that's very useful, right? You have these mountain raiders that the communists can't necessarily get to easily. And it's like, hey, what if we just give these guys a bunch of guns and they go in and mess things up and harass the PLA and keep them from spreading, but also maybe do a little bit of our dirty work and all they want is a couple hundred bucks or like some modern technology that we can get for next to nothing. The M16s. Like a pretty good deal. Literally, M16s, yeah. that's what they were provided. How big is Wa State? If it's a million people, what sort of population density? It doesn't sound like a lot if there's a lot of farming and a lot of mountains. Yeah, it's pretty spread out. Um, in Wa State now, there's about 600,000 people. Uh, a big chunk of their, uh, their original territory, their sort of ancient homeland, did get swallowed up by communist China. So that took a big piece of their population away. Wa State now is about 600,000 people. Dude, it's big. I mean, I know it's not on Google Maps, but its territory is big. It's as big as Belgium. Um, if you just look at the, the actual soil of the Netherlands and not its uh, aquatic holdings, it's as big as the Netherlands. It's a vast, hmm. vast place. I mean, it's not easy to run a nation state that's that large. Right. It's expensive, in fact. So unlike, I know people's idea of drug traffickers comes from Mexican cartels. And Mexican cartels principally are um, financial engines. They're trying to make money. They're trying to make profit. Uh, the, the, the financial engine of Wa State is narcotics. They do other stuff, but primarily make their money from narcotics. And a lot of that goes into upholding and defending their homeland. I'm not trying to make them sound super noble or anything, but just as a, a matter of fact, um, they they need a lot of money to to not get swallowed up so it's it's for a they have an a, a, a nationalist agenda not just a profit seeking motive that's interesting so it's it, it's hard to say right it's it's a, whereas drug cartels in mexico are business operations pretty much solely this is almost more like it's kind of they kind of have the reverse proportions right it almost seems like a nationalist thing and it's like well the only way we're going to be able to fund this thing is through drug trade and then that became but it's hard to say who's pulling the strings now because once you get a taste of that sweet drug money it's probably really hard to let it go so this is much of what my book is about there there was a um a clash within wa state uh that got really hot in the 90s where you had one figure one leader trying to pull it in the opposite direction, saying, hey, let's actually make friends with America and wind down the drug trade. That's what's going to be better for our survival. There was their, their trafficker in chief, the drug lord, wanted to make it into an even more powerful narco state. And so when the DEA says, oh, that's just a criminal syndicate, they're just this like jungle mafia. No, there's this has been this internal clash as what they what they want to be. And I got most of that story from one of the top three leaders of former leaders of Wa State, who was himself a DEA informant. So it's it's quite a story. Yeah, the book goes into a lot of detail on that. How, how armed are these guys? Because it sounds like the CIA armed them, but I assume at some point we kind of wound that down. And uh, look, small arms are powerful if you're harassing jungle patrols on the border of China in the 1950s and 60s. But if you want to really protect yourself, you need more than that. So I'm, how armed are they and where do they get the weapons? Yeah. And just to be clear, the CIA has not been entangled with um, um, propping up any WA people since since the Cold War. Um, since they founded their nation state, they've more or less been targets of, of the CIA. But as far as their arms go, Good. They're they're they get weapons funneled to them from the People's Liberation Army. Uh, Beijing will deny this, but when you look at the stockpile of Wa weapons, which they show off in parades, you're going to see anti-aircraft weapons. You're going to see heavy artillery, armed personnel car carriers, um, you know, high-end automatic rifles, mortars, uh, armed drones. Even it's a pretty sophisticated military. 
So you may ask yourself, why would China support a heavily armed yeah. narco state? I, it almost sounds like right on its borders. Yeah, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, right? It, it does. Yeah, <laughs> um, it does. It's not. Everybody can go to Google and you can look up uh, wall leaders who are indicted by the DEA, some of the DEA's most wanted people in Asia, doing photo ops with diplomats appointed by Xi Jinping. So it's very much real. Uh, China has a different strategy than the U.S. does. So the U.S. on the on the American Mexican border, it's primary mission is to go in and bust up cartels uh, and lock up drug lords. I mean, that's its ultimate goal. When you do that, you, you create these power vacuums and smaller cartels rush in to, to fight it out. And you have these all this bloodshed, hundreds of thousands of people killed in Mexico over these, over these feuds. I'm not blaming all of that on, on the United States, but we play a role in, in, in keeping that going. Sure. China, China has a different strategy. So it looks at the big bad cartel, for lack of a better word, on its border. And it says, wouldn't it be better if we could control them? Wouldn't it be better mm. if we had one big leviathan, one big whale that we could have a say in what they do, that they were indebted to us because they get their weapons from us? And what's the alternative? to have power vacuums and a bunch of smaller piranhas just chewing each other to bits, massive amounts of bloodshed on the Chinese border. They don't want that. So they play a different game. And just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the US take up that model because I don't see a nationalist nation building project in Mexico. No. So it's it's not, it's, it's, it's a different circumstance. But the problem is, Jordan, the DEA just applies the same model to the WA. Oh, they're-, they're right. They're a trafficking syndicate, must destroy them, must, you know, wipe out their executive branch, their leadership, and there, therein lies the problem. Yeah. It, by the way, to be clear, I'm sure when you say you don't see a nation state building force in Mexico, you mean from the drug cartels, right? Because the Mexican government and people who live in Mexico are certainly trying to build a functioning democracy uh, for all its faults, right? You yeah. just mean the drug cartels are not nationalists. They don't care about Mexico, I, which I agree with that. Yeah, I, I don't see an indigenous movement in Sinaloa trying to you know, break free and create a new state of Sinaloa that is you know, a shining beacon for the Sinaloan people or something like that. No, the, the right. Mexico as a nation state, it's 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 built. It's it's already there. And yeah, the the, it, the analogy, the analogy doesn't work, and that's fine. Um, Latin America and Southeast Asia are two very different places, but our policy is informed by Latin America principally, and then it gets applied to Southeast Asia, and it doesn't quite work. And this is why the DEA has been very unsuccessful in um, taking down the WA. I'm guessing if they get their weapons from the Chinese, they can say, oh, and by the way, we don't want to see any of the meth you guys produce in China. Are they able to do that? Or is it just kind of like, well, it's still drugs and hard to control? Yeah, I never landed like a document that said, we the Wa people will not send any meth into China. But um, the, the man I mentioned earlier, this principal source of mine was a top Wa leader and a DEA asset. Um, he told me, Yes, in fact, it's it's understood. It's an unwritten policy of the WA. We're not going to let any meth or any drugs seep into China. And that means that this works out to Beijing's benefit as well. Right, Drugs got to go somewhere. So they pour into Thailand. And from Thailand, there are ports where drugs can be shipped all across the world. And just to be clear, the WA are not the principal masterminds of the Asian drug trade writ large. Primarily, it's a place to produce drugs. And then you have these, namely ethnic Chinese, international trafficking syndicates who move it around the region and around the world. Why don't the WA do that? Well, um, for one thing, they're primarily focused on their territory, their nation. And also being an international drug trafficking syndicate is a very complex, sophisticated <laughs> logistical operation. It requires people who speak your same language in multiple cities around the world. The WA are pretty focused on themselves. They just don't have that network. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's it makes perfect sense that Chinese merchants or just an international merchant class. I mean, they could just as easily be Brits, right? Doing doing this kind of thing. Uh, They're well suited to it. And if you have crime syndicates like Chinese triads or whatever, those guys are all over the world. Every major city pretty much has them. And they go way, way back. A lot of ties, a lot of real estate, a lot of logistical infrastructure for everything from human trafficking. So why not drug trafficking, especially in their own backyard, Southeast Asia? So that, yeah, it's quite fascinating that this is kind of how it works. Wa State sounds a little bit like anarchic. I mean, maybe that's not quite right. The head, cutting off of the head seemed a little anarchic, but they stopped that. Surely they have rules and laws. Do they have police? They must have things like police and, and pe- judges. Or, or is it a little less formal than that? Police, um, pretty sleek highways. Yes, their own laws. Um, it's, it's sort of tempting to say it's a lawless place and law enforcement will tend to call it that. No, not exactly. I mean, look, it's not Denmark. And I'm not saying it's a nice place to live. I think in a more ideal world, the profits from the drug trade, more of that would be shared with the general populace. So just like, say, Saudi Arabia is a petro state, and it uses petroleum to finance, you know, uh, uh, things for its people. Wa State could do a better job of being a narco state that spreads the narco wealth into you know, why, why couldn't you have a better school system? Why couldn't you have better hospitals? It doesn't have much of a safety net there. So not enough of it is shared, but I mean, shocker. I, mean, <laughs> I don't think anyone will be too astonished to, to hear that. But as a nation state, yes, it is uh, pretty highly functioning. Um, anarchic is not a way that I would, I would describe it at all. Yeah, it doesn't quite sound like that. I mean, before earlier, and I'm reading the book, and it's like if you wander outside your village, someone pounces and cuts your head off, your head off, and then puts it on a spike and fertilizes their garden with it, with your magical spirit that comes out of your brain or whatever they they were believing. This is more. This certainly sounds more like a. What's the right word? Is it more like an oligarchy where just rich drug lords have the power and. Are, are we talking about a lot of corruption? And and it seems like the at least the wealth gap is quite large. Yeah. But what what did you feel? I mean, you went there, and we'll talk about that in a second. But you went there. Does it feel safe or does it feel chaotic? Um, this will blow people's minds. It's probably it's probably the most stable place inside the country right now. So Myanmar, in, as in, a, inside of Burma, yeah, inside yeah. of Burma, Burma, Myanmar, it's, uh, they're undergoing a raging revolution. Some call it a civil war, uh, Wa state because it's autonomous stands apart from that. And there are no battles there. There is no war there. Um, we don't have a perfect vision or insight into everything happening there. So I'm not saying it's free of violence. It's far from utopian. I would never say anything like that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's stable. And I mean, one, this has been a people who have been isolated, in part by choice for quite a long time, that's becoming less and less true. So the the Chinese version of TikTok is called Douyin. And yeah, Douyin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't speak Chinese. So, yeah, it's okay. Um, it you see, like Wa soldiers, and I'm talking about men and women posting like dreamy montages on TikTok and trying to look cute and doing like TikTok style dances, um, or just like hanging out and drinking beer, and you it really pierces this idea that they're uh, you know this dark people locked away. It's like, no, they're, they're not seeking the outside world's attention, but hey, they're on, they're on social media, break dancing and doing all sorts of stuff. I, I mean, that's got to be kind of interesting to be surfing doyin and then you see like a, I don't know, a wa narco thirst <laughs> trap post. <laughs> Just like, what's going on here? What's, what's up with the beret? Oh, I see. Oh, it, what's with the kilo of... <laughs> meth or whatever behind this this woman in the photo oh i see she's flexing like it's just kind of a funny mental image the the, the there's uh the wa state army united wa state army has a lot of female soldiers a lot 
Um, and so you, you see them on there just as much as the guys. It right. really, yeah. When you think of, when you, when you think of narco picture, like a narco, a narco warrior or whatever, you're few people are going to imagine a, a woman, um, a small Asian woman. Yeah. That's not the first thing that pops into your mind. And right. to be honest, Jordan, like the 30,000 troops in the United Wa state army primarily are not um, involved in the narco trafficking trade specifically, it's really kind of this division. So you have the, the army, which is there to uphold the state. And I mean, because everyone's scared of them, they don't have anyone to fight. So a lot of times you see them like gardening or patching up <laughs> potholes on the road and things like that. Then you have separately a ministry of finance that orchestrates the drug trafficking. And these days, um, they, I mean, they used to produce it all in house, but these days they've kind of gotten more sophisticated. Often they'll invite an outside, usually Chinese criminal syndicate onto their territory and say, so this would be a good place to build a meth lab. It's next to a stream. Meth labs need a lot of water. Uh, you guys build it. You go find the chemist. We may play a role in helping source the chemicals because the chemicals to make meth come from the same general Chinese pharmaceutical chemical industry that produces the chemicals that are made into fentanyl and sold to Americans. It's a whole other story. But yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll play a, 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 a limited role in this. Why don't you guys do all the hard work and we'll just collect rent. We'll just tax the operation. This is a smarter, more corporate way to be involved in, in the drug trade. You don't have to do it all yourself. Right. So th they're basically then acting as like the administrators of a special economic zone instead of trying to be state run industries with little education and, and resources like bring in the pros, bring in the pros, let them run here. We run security. We take we they pay us taxes slash rent and we're good. You're right. That is pretty. Uh, it seems like a better division of labor. And it's also it, it probably keeps things a little bit more calm at home too, it, just the political kind of, and it ties them further with China. I mean, this is all kind of good things that for them that come from that. How big is the drug trade then with Wa State? Do we, do we have a dollar figure at all? Uh, sort of. So the UN will say that the Asian meth trade, which is the largest meth trade in the world, the overall economy is about $60 billion. So just to put that into perspective, like most countries' GDPs aren't $60 billion. There are countries in Southeast Asia that have smaller economies than that. But that's looking at the Asian meth trade from top to bottom. That is counting the value of the trucks that carry the meth and the street dealers in Australia who might be selling meth produced in Wa State somewhere in Sydney. So that's, that's a giant number. Um, I've had people ask me like, oh, so, so Wa State has a GDP of $60 billion? No, I don't know what the GDP of Wa State is. I'm not sure that the leaders know either. That's really hard to put a, put a, put a dollar amount on. Um, I would imagine it's in the billions, but it's not quite that large. A lot of the, a lot of the money is really flushing into the, the syndicates that move it across borders. So the WA might have a role moving it into Thailand, but then from there, it goes to one of Thailand's ports and it goes, it could go all the way to Japan or, or Taiwan or Australia. Every time a kilo of, of meth or heroin or anything jumps a border, it jumps up in value. And so I think it's actually those international syndicates that are soaking up the really big profits. Yeah, that that does make a lot of sense. What do you think that the drug trade in Wa State is bigger than the GDP of Burma, or is that a ridiculous idea? I don't trust the GDP figure for for Burma for Myanmar. Uh, it's somewhere in the fifty billion range. The it illegal says sixty five, but if they're self reporting, eh, okay. Yeah, who knows? I mean, I don't trust that at all. There's so many things that are sold illegally in Burma from gyms to timber, there's human trafficking, there's an arms trade. Um, it's just a highly unstable figure. So no, I mean, I wouldn't imagine that it's bigger. The GDP for Wa State is bigger than Myanmar just because Myanmar is a much bigger country. Obviously, Wa State sort of nests inside of it. But I'll put it, I'll, I'll put it this way, Jordan. 
they're bringing in a lot of money. Like mm-hmm. the the they primarily produce primarily producing crystal meth, which is like the stuff you see on Breaking Bad. But yeah. they have a different type of meth that um, was pioneered by Wa State's premier drug lord. His name is Wei Shikang. This is a little pink pill called Yaba. And it's got about 20% meth in it. The rest is caffeine and other fillers. It smells like Oreos, like the vanilla cream filling of Oreos. So they, they, they sent it. This stuff. Oh, sells... they sent it. It's not just a coincidence. That's <laughs> no, it's probably not... a good idea because yeah. it probably smells disgusting if you don't do that. Uh, I've, I've been in the room where, uh, large bags of this have been cut open and it smells like you're in like a candy store or something. Um, <laughs> and this stuff, I, I tried to compare it to something that uh, Westerners would understand, like Big Macs, right? So the best data I could find on Big Macs was that somewhere in the neighborhood of like half a billion are sold a year. It could be more than that. But according, again, to the UN, two to six billion of these meth, pink meth pills are being produced every year. Not entirely wow. in Was State, but but a lot of them are. I mean... They also sell for about uh, $2. I've been away from the U.S. a long time. I don't know how much Big Macs are going for, but okay, we're in a similar price point. Um, Just a massive, 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 massively popular product here in Asia. And you take meth, especially a pill that only has 20% meth, you might perform better at your job if you're doing really repetitive labor. So if I'm cutting up pineapples that are going to be sold in Walmart somewhere, or I'm stitching up sneakers that are going to be sold, you know, in the mall somewhere, um, I'm doing something over and over and over and over. And if you're on meth, that repetition becomes kind of pleasurable. So it actually has a, a, a role to play in the economy. No, no one's doing fentanyl here in Southeast Asia. Even heroin is not very popular anymore. It's all about meth. I can't, it's really shocking that it outsells this Yaba, outsells Starbucks or McDonald's in these places. And do they, do they stamp a logo on the pills like they do with ecstasy in Europe and the United States or so I've heard? Oh yeah, they do. Um, every meth pill or many meth pills are stamped with the letters W Y. I have been asked many, many times, and I've tried to find the answer as to why those two letters are the like logo. I mean, it's as recognizable to Asian drug users as the Nike swoosh, as I say in my book. I don't know exactly what the WY is all about. Um, but I do know this. Originally, in say, the middle of the last century, uh, amphetamine tablets were sold here and they were sold by Burroughs Welcome, a huge pharmaceutical company. Those pills had a horse, uh, I, I believe a unicorn stamped on them. And so uh, Thai people called them Ya Ma. Ya means medicine and Ma means horse. Um, when at some point, uh, the when the DEA came and created a huge base of operations in Thailand, those things became illegal. Nobody sold them anymore except on the black market. So you had all these guys making up what they called horse pills, amphetamine pills in uh, back alleys and things like that. It was really the WA who seized the initiative to produce those at scale. And then they became called Ya Ba. Ba means crazy. So crazy meds or insanity pills. So that's a quick potted history of, of the Ya Ba meth pills that are super popular. Yes, they are branded. One other thing, it's interesting about branding. When they produce crystal methamphetamine, you you can't stamp a logo on a crystalline shard of meth. So they put them in uh, tea pouches. They're shiny foil pouches that say this certain brand of tea. Well, that brand of tea doesn't exist. It's It's just a way to show traffickers down the chain this was produced in a solid facility. This is going to be upwards of 95% pure. When you see this tea brand, you know it's good stuff. Wow. That's quite interesting. The idea that they've got branding and, 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 and 
the idea that they have like brand loyalty, branding, almost like a marketing department kind of thing here with the stamping and the wrapping. It's really, I mean, it, that's part of, partly a real business. And you can just see how far they've come, so to speak, with this stuff. Back in the day, they were making a third of global opium or something like that. Right on brand for Cold War CIA times. Opium becomes heroin trade. A heroin smuggled through Thailand to Bangkok, sold to Chinese gangsters, makes its way, I think, to Vietnam, right, and into the veins of the American troops there. And then why the, why the switch to meth? Is it just easier to transport and make, or what? what? Is heroin less popular now? I don't even really know. I'll give credit to the principal trafficker in chief of Wa State, is again, same as Wei Shikang. Um, I give him credit as a visionary here. He went all synthetic before any of the Mexican cartels did. He saw the writing on the wall. When you have to rely on a crop like coca or the opium poppy, it kind of sucks. I mean, you have to rely on this army of peasant laborers to produce it. Oh, what if there's a big cold snap and the crop turns out to be not so great? And oh my God, you have to control a lot of land that can't be growing food on that land. It's kind of a pain. So he realized and he convinced the, the WA government to go along with this to wholesale shift to methamphetamine for two reasons. Um, one, it was understood that methamphetamine could be a more popular drug in Southeast Asia as, as heroin was sort of phasing out. Um, and two, if you're primarily producing methamphetamine, which is what the Southeast Asian market wants, you can sell it within Asia. At this point, they did this in the late 90s, early 2000s. So at that point, Southeast Asia had a, a vibrant enough, you know, working class. They could afford drugs. Back in the day, Vietnam era, Vietnam War era, you want to sell narcotics at scale. You have to sell to Americans. I mean, they're the most, we are the most ravenous consumers of narcotics in the world. We still are. And only Americans and Europeans and others, but all, all, only more developed countries could afford to just gobble up a lot of drugs. If you're taking your heroin into, um, you know, the, the fields and valleys of Southeast Asia, you're going to find a lot of people who grow rice, don't have much money, probably don't even handle that much money. These are not very good consumers of drugs. They can't afford it. That's right. why it was such a godsend when the United States sent so many GIs into Vietnam. You had, you had these young American guys who had a stipend from the military and you had a base. They were also very traumatized because they were in a war and they could afford heroin. So after you got used to selling it to them, then you think, all right, well, we got to sell it to them when they come, go back home as well. And it wasn't until the early 2000s when Southeast Asia was rich enough to buy its own drugs. And methamphetamine is what they want. You focus on them. And by not selling heroin to the United States anymore, it helps the DEA stay off your back. I mean, the DEA is still going to come after you, but they can't justify a massive, expensive paramilitary style war against your territory. Thanks for watching on YouTube. Remember, you can also enjoy The Jordan Harbinger Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Our podcast feed is a treasure trove of insights from intellectuals, authors, spies, artists, athletes, pioneers, engineers, former mafia bosses, and business leaders, all sharing their secrets to success. For more information, click the link in the description. Now, back to the show. You mentioned earlier the, the division in Wall State. Some people wanted drugs and money. Other people, I guess, thought, hey, we're never going to develop further if we can't get assistance and join the legitimate world. So does that division still exist? I know you mentioned there's Christian groups in Wa State. So I assume missionaries got in there at some point if there were Christians. And, but, or or are they kind of, have they kind of squashed that and now they're all rowing in the same direction? Yeah, I should probably back up and explain how I would even know about this because like Jordan, for the past 10 years, I've been trying to like peer into the inner circle of WA leadership. I mean, it, it most of these guys are indicted by the DEA. So it is kind of like trying to get an interview with El Chapo or something like that. It's a mission impossible. Um, it was about five years ago when um, 
I was becoming friendly with a, a Wa guy in Myanmar in a city close to Wa State, a town. And he knew I was trying to interview the leadership. And he, he had met them. He was pretty high up in the United Wa State Army. And he said, okay, I'm ready to introduce you to my father-in-law. You want to interview a leader? Let's go meet my father-in-law. So who the hell is your father-in-law? It's like, all right, we'll see. So we walk up the street to this compound with security cameras on all the awnings, big cement compound, and we're let inside, I go through the gates. We're sitting in this very sort of austere living room. And I look around and I see two things that are really interesting. One is a portrait of Mr. Father-in-law in a WA uniform in his younger days, looking very debonair. I was like, oh, this guy was, was really high up. Um, and the, I, I mean, I'm, I'm used to seeing like, you think of WA leaders or DEA indicted guys, you think of mugshots, right? But this guy was, you know. The other thing I noticed on the other wall is a portrait of Jesus with like blonde Jesus. Pretty blonde unusual. Blonde Jesus or blind Jesus? Uh, presu- I, didn't, I don't know if he could see, but he was definitely blonde. <laughs> okay. That is, um, I guess, an interesting Sure. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I said, okay, this guy is Christian, which is unusual for a WA leader because yeah. most of them are not just anti-American, but anti-West in general. So in walks a former top three leader of WA state. And at this point he's in his seventies. Um, he, he, he flops down. He, he asks who I am. I tell him, look, I'm American. I also said I was a journalist. I figure this is the part where I get thrown out. But he kind of went, if you're lucky. All right, you know, what do you want to know? And the reason he was comfortable with me, I mean, this guy is like, he's like a figure from the Old Testament. He's he looks you right in the eyes because he's like dark, compelling eyes. He has this um, kind of sandpapery voice. He's just, He's, he's just a very severe person. He had been a top DEA asset. And as I went and continued to visit with him and visit with him, he eventually revealed this to me. Um, he said that he was one of the most important informants for the DEA in Southeast Asia ever. So I had to check that out. I went, I asked him for the names of his DEA handlers, tracked a few of them down, And they said, oh, yeah, that guy's legit. We called him Superstar. That was his code name. So look, being a journalist, I have to check out everyone's (laughs) story. So I go back to this man. His name is Saul Lu. And I say, Saul Lu, just trying to check everything out here. What was your code name? And he goes, oh, yeah, Superstar. So this is the guy who is trying to take Wa State in a different direction. This is the guy who, because he was his family was Christianized by missionaries, wants to, he believes in America and he believes America is this great Christian nation that can like save his people from the darkness, which is in his mind, drugs. And so he worked with the DEA to team up, like the DEA teaming up with the drug cartel to have them wind down their operation in exchange for American aid. So he, he was the principal driver of this movement to, to unite the law with the Americans, which is pretty extraordinary. Yeah, that must have been, I mean, that was kind of your 10 years to a lucky break situation from the sound of it. Wow. Yeah, I'd stuck around long enough that it felt like a lucky break, but when you're obsessed with something for 10 years and you keep beating your head against the wall, I guess eventually the door opens. Yeah, that's kind of how a lot of this stuff works, eh? It must have still been so hard to get into Wa State. I, how did you end up getting into the territory? Because when you met this guy, this was in what, Rangoon or something like that in Burma? Like he wasn't living in, or was he living in Wa State when you met him? And how, if so, how did you get there? Yeah, he, he was living in a, a Burmese town called Lashio, which is about 50 miles from Wa State. Um, When you're a top level leader and also a DEA informant um, that has a way of bringing you into conflict with the the other Wa leaders. And at that point, he had been driven out. So yeah, I did not meet him in in Wa State. 
So how did you get into Wa State? I assume you didn't get smuggled in because you're still alive and your head is not rotting on a spike. So <laughs> hey, they I, quit headhunting, Jordan. Come anymore. on. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, my head is firmly attached. Maybe not firmly, but um, I, I had been asking to go to their capital and to interview their their current leaders, DEA indicted leaders, for a long time. Um, once I forged this relationship with Saw Lu, this former leader, who at that point was on the outs with them, I became a known quantity to the Wa government. And that certainly hurt my chances of going to the Capitol and sitting in the boardroom with one of the leaders, which, hey, maybe that never would have happened anyway. Also, COVID happened and mm. the Wa State went into lockdown. So I had to get creative. Um, what I did is I went to a the perimeter of Wa State, which also touches uh, northern Thailand. So if if anyone's ever been backpacking in Thailand, if you were to keep going north and north and north, you would go into Myanmar. That's what it will say on Google Maps. But if you go over at the right part, you're actually going into Wa State. Um, so I went across the border into the fringes of Wa State, into a village that was still in the process of being like dominated by the United Wa State Army. And so from this village, I mean, it, you could see Wa fortresses up on the hill looking looking down on it. They, the at that point, the Wa State government was dictating terms to this village, which was not ethnically Wa. It was, most of the people there were from a, a different indigenous group, but they were being swallowed up by, by Wa State, which is still expanding as best it can today. Oh, wow. So there, are they... Is it kind of colonizing other parts of Burma? Yeah, actually, its territory just expanded uh, two weeks ago. Um, it is it is still actively expanding. It has other um, revolutionary militias around its territory that do its bidding, or maybe that's putting it too strong, but it it funds them, it gives them weapons, it supports them. It's it's a growing nation state. I mean, it's a young country. It's only existed for 35 years and it would like to expand as best it can. So yeah, I, if anybody has listened to this and thought that I was describing Wa State as this great noble enterprise, I think it's a legitimate enterprise to want their own nation state, but they've done ethnic cleansing. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of nations in their founding stages engage in ethnic cleansing and the the Wa government has done that too. So when I was in this village, you know, with the Wa fortress looming looming above us, I had villagers telling me pretty horrific stories about people being hurt and maimed and driven out of their homes and you know trying to farm rice very recently and having Wa officers come down and be like, nope, you can't do that, kind of starving them out. So it was um it was the other side of the coin. Yeah. Yeah, yikes. So who is the leader of Wa State now? Or is it sort of a group? You have a council of people or do they have a president, a dictator? How does it work? <laughs> um, I said they're highly organized. They're not quite organized enough to have a dictator. Like it, it ain't North Korea, you know, they don't, right. it's not an Orwellian state or anything like that. Um, yeah, they do have a, a leader. His name is Bao, Bao Yuxiang. Um, this was a man who, according to my research, had actually participated in some headhunting when he was a young man, possibly a, a teenager. But you can hear that and think, oh my God, what a, you know, uh, what a psycho or something like that. Nah, that's not how it is. I mean, these guys to to maintain a rogue nation state with the CIA bearing down on you and the Chinese Communist Party bearing down on you and and others and to, to uphold well, it got to be pretty Burma, smart, right? The yeah, junta, the junta in yeah. Burma he's kept them out too. So you can't write this guy off as a simpleton. I mean, I think he's playing. I think the 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 ruling council, the ruling Politburo of Wa State are playing a political game that is far more sophisticated than any played by anyone in U.S. Congress. I think if you went into U.S. Congress and grabbed someone from either party and had them play like 
40 chess <laughs> at the at the level that the Wa are playing, they wouldn't last two weeks. These guys are very sophisticated operators. I mean, it's not it's not easy. In most scenarios, if we were to look into the multiverse, in most scenarios, this thing flops, right? They're an indigenous people. There's only half a million to a million of them. They are hated by their neighbors. It's not going to work out, but it did work out. And that's kind of the, what I want to put across in my book. Like this, this is a serious nation state. Like you might want to take it seriously. Is the leader that you mentioned, Bao, is he also the chief dr drug trafficker or is he kind of more a civilian administrator of the territory? He's more like the strong man. Okay. Yeah. He, um, a, a lot of Wa people don't like this, uh, but it's sometimes said about them that in Wa state, you have the muscle and the brains. So the muscle is Bao. He's the guy who runs the, the army. He's the guy who runs really the, the nation. Um, then you have Wei. He's the financial mastermind. He happens to be half Chinese and speaks Chinese fluently. So he's more able to plug into the international narcotics trade. Um, so Wei would be the real figurehead for running the drug operation. Wei Shikang, again, I think he is the most successful drug lord perhaps ever, because after all, he's not caught. But this is a guy who, I mean, if you were to look at, he dresses like he's like, the manager of a radio shack or something. He doesn't wear a bunch of gold rings. He doesn't wear a bunch of jade. He doesn't have a big harem. He's a germaphobe. I think he could fairly diagnose him with uh, OCD. He's really smart though. And he's incredible at his job. He loves to make money. I don't even think he likes to spend it. He just loves to generate profit. So he's not a leader of men. I mean, there's very few photos of him in existence. He doesn't want to be anyone's great leader. He doesn't want everyone's adoration. Um, so he's handling the financial side, but you got to have a face on things. And that's, that's, that's bow. So muscle and the brains. How do they launder and transfer money, right? Because if they're dealing in essentially a cash business, but with Chinese gangsters, do they, what good is the money if they hike it up a mountain? You know, how do they, how do they handle the logistics here? Do you know? Yeah, I do know a little bit about that. And the DEA has targeted their, their shell companies as well. Um, yeah, while leaders have uh, quite a number of shell companies, um, they, at one point, uh, were big stakeholders in an airline in, in Burma. Um, Everything from banks to casinos. Um, back in the day, they were producing CDs. I mean, or they had a stake in like uh, just this like very promiscuous portfolio of things yeah. from cement factories to chemical factories to making CDs to um, um, loan sharking. So they, they spread it all around. There is sort of a WA ink out there that, that, uh, controls a lot of money. Again, my argument is that I wish that they would, all right, if you're going to make money from the drug trade, I wish that you would build more schools and hospitals with that. But that's just my personal critique. Yeah, I, I get it. I mean, that's kind of the problem, right? Is, is once you get a taste of that, you're like, why should I share this with other people when I can buy a villa in France and nobody can do anything about it? I mean, that's, that's the problem with crime and not having rule of law in, in many ways. Is this, by the way, is this area where King's Roman Casino is? I, we did a show about cyber slavery in that area and also wildlife trafficking, which episode 545. And the guest on that show, Rachel Newer, she went undercover and went to King's Roman Casino. And I want to say it was on the border of Thailand and Burma or something like that, but I'm not sure. Is this is this the same kind of lawless area? Uh, King's Roman Casino is also under sanctions from the U.S. government, in part because the U.S. alleges that it's been sort of a way station for methamphetamine flowing out of Wa State to the international market. So yeah, it's in the it's in the constellation of of this underworld. It, I've spent some time there myself. Fascinating place. I mean, uh, if you want to buy methamphetamine or ketamine in King's Roman, 
very easy and no one's going to give you any trouble for it. Look, if you go out here on the streets of Bangkok and smoke meth in public, you, you, you'll probably get arrested. It, King's Roman, it's just highly available. And yeah, it's, it's kind of plugged into the, to that general underworld, for sure. What is that casino like? I, you know, the only kind of casinos I've been into are in Vegas, essentially, or like a small, tiny one in some European city or like Monte Carlo. I'm imagining these are a little bit like a Motel 6 to the Ritz-Carlton in comparing a King's Roman's Casino to, I don't know, Caesar's, Caesar's Palace, maybe. It, it seems like it's a pretty gnarly place. Wildlife trafficking, underage prostitution, meth trade, human slavery, eh. You know, I'm I'm a gambling CD man myself. Quite do it. Yeah, I, I like gambling myself, and uh, I, nothing is more fun than like a hot craps table, right? <laughs> um, no, in this casino, it's all baccarat, uh, which I find an extremely boring game. But the King's Roman complex in general is catering to um, uh, mainland Chinese visitors primarily. So baccarat is their game of choice. It's what they like. Um, in general, like a Chinese casino is less like, you know, uh, wild weekend with the boys and a little more like I'm going to sit here and smoke cigarettes and drink milk tea and focus on my Baccarat game. So it's a different, it's a different gambling culture. The casino in general is just a weird place. I mean, you walk up to it and there are these giant statues of, um, I think they're like Roman gods or something like that, or they're supposed to be. It's hard to tell. These Corinthian pillars, I mean, it looks like a, like a Jersey mob boss is having a, a psychotic fever dream, and this is what like got spat out. It's, a, it's an odd place. Yeah, stopping the smuggling of this stuff, it, it's, it's got to be very difficult, right? Because the, the Wa seem super loyal to one another. You mentioned in the book they often hang themselves in the jail cell if they get captured and they almost never talk. That is something like straight out of a a movie, like a ninja movie, like or 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 um, who kills themselves when they get caught? It's like something KGB spies did in the Cold War. It's crazy. Yeah, that was a story told to me by a Thai anti narcotics agent who, when when this yaba these meth pills started really flooding into Thailand, they had orders to you know catch Wa people and flip them. So a, 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 a team of like, let's say, usually they would travel with 10 guys and eight of them have on big, heavy backpacks full of meth. And there's one guy in the front of the column and one guy in the back with automatic rifles. And they would come across the border into Thailand, drop it off and zip it back across the border. So what the Thai military was trying to do is catch one of these Wa guys and flip them and turn them into CIs, confidential informants, and send them back into the Wa drug trafficking operation to snitch. Uh, massive failure, massive failure. They wouldn't talk, according to what this uh, soldier told me, wouldn't talk at all. He was massively frustrated. So he would put them in a cement cell. And at one point, as he told me, they figured out if they left a length of rope in there that a lot of the people they caught would kill themselves rather than facing the judicial system. And this guy was so bitter about it, I think he was perfectly happy with that outcome. But yeah, they, there's all types, just like in any culture, there's all types of people. And I've met some of the most sensitive, loving, caring WA people you could ever imagine. So giving, so trusting. Um, but when you do hear stories like that, it 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 makes you think there is another side, this like warrior ethos that also still exists in the culture. What's the capital city of Wa State and what is that place like? In the book, you kind of talk about it briefly. You say it has everything Rangoon has, but what does that mean? That's kind of like saying, oh, this place is everything Pyongyang has in North Korea. It's like, well, okay, so no electricity half the time and nothing works, right? It's What is it really like there? It's... um most people would look at it and it would remind them of a like a second or third tier Chinese city. So it's up in the mountains. It's right on the border with China to facilitate trade coming over very easily. Um, paved streets. They have got some casinos, um, a lot of like administrative buildings. It's a, 
you know, all around it is very pastoral, but the the city itself, somewhere between a town and a city, and street lights, police, um, you know, it, it, if you're picturing like a hideout with skulls on the walls, it's certainly not that. And from my understanding, the electricity is 24 hours a day. Hey, they got a bowling alley. Um, in, if you were to go to the capital of, of Myanmar, uh, Yangon or Rangoon, they call it, um, it's going to be a much more tense environment, especially because the, the revolution, the civil war is underway. Um, power does go out a lot. There's a lot of poverty. Um, I'm not saying that the Wa capital is a paradise by any means, but compared to the reputation, it's surprisingly um, surprisingly developed. I know Chinese people call Wa State Shanjai Zhongguo, which means like knock off China. And it's actually a really clever play on words, right? Because it also means mountain fortress China which is because Shanjai means mountain fortress, but it also means somehow it also means knockoff, like counterfeit goods. And I was pretty actually, actually pretty damn proud of my Mandarin that I understood that play on words when you wrote about it. But I assume that they don't like being called that. No, they don't. Um, yeah, it's kind of like uh, the... The, the Chinese like slur on Wa State would be like, it picture like a Rolex watch that says like Rolex and it's got like one letter off. Like, oh, haha, it's like a, a bootleg imitation of China. No, man, Wa people hate that. And um, right now there's a new crop of leaders coming up who are in their, most of them in their 40s and 50s. And they have a decision to make. So are they going to continue being more or less a client state of China? Because let's face it, the whole experiment with allying with the U.S. didn't work out, thanks to the CIA. So they've got to have a strong relationship with China. There's no way around it. Um, but could they push back more? Could do? Are they in a position where they could say, if if Beijing makes a request that they don't want to make, they don't want to honor, could they say, nah, next? And at the moment, they. They, they do their best to kind of ride that wave to make sure Beijing is happy and to maintain their autonomy. I mean, I don't think I have to remind um, people that if you're an indigenous minority on the borderlands of China, like Tibetan or Uyghur, um, you will come under heavy suppression from the Chinese state. And the, the, the Wa have faced that threat as well. This is one reason why, even though they're buddy buddy with China, because they have to be, that's one reason they need their own nation state. So they're not totally swallowed by China. It's a really difficult equilibrium to maintain. So where are we now then, as a, the West now with the Wa? Are we trying to stop them from selling drugs? Have we given up on trying to stop them from selling drugs? Are we helping them somehow do something, develop, et cetera? Or are we just kind of like, well, can't get in there, hands off? More the latter. So, I mean, I talked to many DEA agents, former DEA agents uh, for this book, um, as well as a lot of WA figures as well, lots of anti-narcotics folks. And so I, I got the story from them. But when I went to the DEA headquarters and just asked for some participation in this, I mean, they, they seem happy to talk about uh, Mexican cartels, right? Uh, they kind of brushed me off. And all right, look, they, they have no obligation to talk to me, right? But I'm pretty sure the reason is because they don't have a positive story to tell here. You know, the, the, the strategy of the DEA is to build up some figure that you've never heard of, some drug trafficker into a big monster, and then they go slay him or lock him up, right? And there have been some efforts to make a sort of a villain character out of Wa figures, namely this drug trafficker Wei Shikang. But you have to slay him or lock him up to reap the rewards. And they just can't. I mean, the only way that they could stop him is by invading. And they're just not going to do that. So I think it's a bit of an embarrassment for the DEA. And it's another indictment of the drug war in general. I will just add that, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty critical of the drug war in the book. However, I did meet some DEA agents along the way who I respected 
greatly who I found to be, you know, moral driven people. And so I don't want people to think this is a bash the bash the US government book either. I'm just trying to tell reality as it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Are they shifting at all the WA to maybe some cyber crime now? Because I heard, again, at King's Roman Casino, like extortion scams, crypto scams, online gambling, or is that mostly the Chinese gangsters running that stuff? The the recently the WA have hosted some of that stuff. As it turns out, this is a red line for Beijing. So this is something that China did come in and say, you're not doing this because a lot of it, I mean, we hear about it targeting people all over the world, but originally these scam compounds, they were scamming Chinese people. It's a lot right. easier because they speak the same language. WA right. people tend to speak Chinese. And, and so um, yeah, ruining people's lives left and right. And so Beijing stepped in and said, no, no, no. They actually even put out arrest warrants for um, some like mid-tier WA leaders. And as I understand it, so far, the WA government is participating in bringing justice to these guys. So this is one area where I think the WA will, will lay off. It's not worth it. You don't want Beijing to be pissed off at you. No. Yeah, interesting that they're able to enforce their will out there. Well, it seems like the WA are not going anywhere. I wonder, is the junta in Burma trying to take them out at all? Or are they just kind of like, yep, there's another country inside our country. Can't do anything about that. <laughs> Good luck. They, <laughs> they know better. They know better. Like the WA government is the most stable government in Myanmar. Um, they, they, it's the most, it's one of the most like peaceful places in Myanmar. Why? The junta can't go in there. I mean, they I don't think they could defeat the WA. For one thing, you're talking about heavy mountain fighting. So that's something that highlanders are better at than lowlanders, which is where most of the the Burmese troops are going to come from. Right now, the regime is getting its ass kicked by much smaller players. So to take on the WA, forget about it. And then you have they have to wonder about what happens when if they wage war on the WA. And China steps in and says, these guys are our, our little buddies, our protectorate, hands off. China is, is supplying a lot of the uh, weaponry to Myanmar's regime. Even though the regime is really on the outs with China, China's getting increasingly fed up with them as they crumble. But yeah, no, the, I think, I don't know. I'm, I'm almost willing to predict that Wa State will outlast the Myanmar government as it currently exists. I think Wa State will be there in 100 years. I'm not so sure about Myanmar's regime. Check in with me next year. I'm not sure they'll still be there. Sure. Interesting. What about other groups or other clans? Because whenever there's this much money involved, you just you make enemies of people who just want to steal your business and steal your market shares. Or is there just nobody in a position to do so with the Wa? There's other um, smaller sort of crime families with their own territories all throughout Myanmar's mountains. Um, they also invite international Chinese criminal syndicates to come and run meth labs on their turf. They just don't have as much turf. The WA seem to understand that it's all about geography. You want to control territory. If you can control the territory that is adjacent to uh, the international market, which in this case is Thailand, uh, you're king. Like I said before, you can just invite outsiders to come in, run the meth labs and charge them, charge 20%. So yeah, the smaller operators, they don't have the weapons to take on the WA, but they also just don't have the turf. And if you want to maintain that much turf long-term, you do need kind of a nationalist ideal. I mean, how many people want to fight and die and serve some crime boss? Well, not many. But how many people are willing to uphold and serve a nation that is protecting their indigenous homeland? I think quite a lot. And so the WA have every advantage in that, in that category. Well, it sounds like you're a pretty adventurous person, man. I'm wondering what the next project is for you now that you've cracked WA State. Are you going deeper into that or are you going to pick something else? I think I'm going to breathe for a while. Um, this one really took it out of me, man. Like, um, five years of really grinding before that 10 years of like nipping around at the edges, honestly, dude, like 
I think there's a bigger story to tell I, that that maybe I can't access. I think somebody who is um, um, speaks Chinese, which is the lingua franca of the drug trade in Asia, and who is can blend in better, <laughs> that they might have better luck getting another side to the story or getting deeper than I did. Um, but you got to come to this region. You got to stick around. I've been here 16 years and reporting on crime for 10 of those years. Like I'm just, I'm around, um, in, in, in Spanish, there's this word, uh, I don't speak Spanish, but as I understand this word, narco periodista, which means yeah. like nar narco journalist. And yeah. I would like some more narco periodistas here. Hey, come, come blow the roof off this thing. Do do a better job than I did even. I mean, I hope this sparks greater interest in this, in this world and, and a more nuanced take on it. Uh, not this good versus evil drug war stuff. Well, thanks for coming on the show, man. It's really an interesting look at something that most of us have never even heard of and won't hear about anywhere else for that matter. So thanks for, thanks for indulging us here. Uh, dude, I just wanted to say you, you asked the best questions of anyone that I've talked to so far. That was perfect. I mean, that was, that was the perfect mix of like taking a really fascinating subject that people don't know that much about and like putting it through the filter so that it's relatable and interesting to, to a broader audience. I mean, it, it's a, it's tricky. I mean, I'm trying to do that too, but that, that was very well handled. Thank you for checking out this entire episode on YouTube. If you want to follow up on this topic, check out our podcast feed or visit us on our website at jordanharbinger.com where you can learn more about our guest and dive even deeper into what we discussed today. And remember, YouTube is not the only place that you can check out the Jordan Harbinger Show. Any podcast app should have us. Check out the links in the description where you will find access to our shows that don't appear on YouTube, like Skeptical Sunday, where we debunk topics like crystal healing, GMOs, conspiracy theories, homeopathy, tipping, even lawns. To find out if they're backed by science and logic, or if they're just complete nonsense. Spoiler, many of them are complete nonsense. Also, our Feedback Friday shows where we help people escape from cults, get raises at work, and take all manner of questions from you, the audience, all the way down to the bottom of the barrel. And every episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show has something useful you can take away and apply in your own life and help you navigate what I know can often seem like the overwhelming and paralyzing challenges of modern life. Life can be hard, yes, but we are here to help. And if you appreciate how we help, remember to like, comment, and subscribe.